So hello, hello everyone. Welcome or welcome back to my very small YouTube channel about knitting. My name is Isabel. I am in France. I have three sons and I have three cats. Some have said it's related. And by the way, my cats are all inside the house because it's been raining. So we'll see if they do interact <laughs> between each other once again. Uh, so, and I'm filming these videos in English because I miss talking in English so very, very much. I used to live in the United States, but that was over 32 years ago. And I don't have that many opportunities to be talking in English. So you are my own opportunity to do so about once a week. And today it's going to be a video about my woolly stories. The second video uh, in, that, um, in that series. The first video I made about the yarn I'm knitting from uh, Cotentin and from Lenal West that I visited last summer. So I just came back from visit, visiting my mother and we went to visit the uh, Mohair farm that is about an hour and half away from her. And so I could make some recordings. I did buy some yarn and uh, I'm going to be talking about this beautiful Mohair that I've been uh, working on. Uh, up to now and if that sounds good to you please stay tuned so first what am I wearing I'm wearing the beautiful rainforest canopy shawl by Helen Stewart uh, with Len from uh, yarn from Louis and Lola and both the yarn and uh, the pattern were gift uh, from Rosemary in Australia, so this is uh, an Australian yarn and an Australian uh, designer. She designed um, the rainforest canopy shawl pattern with uh, Louis and Lola yarn. A beautiful, beautiful, beautiful um, yarn. So uh, I went to visit my mother and uh, last summer I discovered uh, La Ferme de la Croche Coeur uh, which is about an hour and a half away south from her. I think I, I'm not sure I recall how I discovered the farm. Maybe it was on Instagram. Maybe it was the lady um, in the Pyrenees I went to visit, another Mohair farm there who talked about it uh, to me. I'm not sure I recall. Anyway, last summer I bought some more hair from her. I went to visit that one farm that is about in the center of France. I'll try to uh, uh, place a map and uh, show you about where it's uh, located. If I can't, I see what I can do, but it's about in the center west center west of France and I've knit everything I bought last summer but one skein of that beautiful mohair uh, and a white a white skin so this is all I have left from uh, what I bought last summer and you may remember I've made um, the Agnes sweater Agnes Jumper by uh, Camilla Val and uh, this was a first to me not to knit color work not to knit mohair but to knit uh, color work with mohair and uh, I've been wearing that sweater a lot it's intact it's not peeling at all it's really behaving very well it's very light it's I, I, I'll, I'll be more precise when um, I edit the video. I think I need maybe 350 grams or less than 400 grams uh, with, um, with that, uh, for that sweater, that big sweater. And I had bought a lot, so I had leftovers. I made, I'm not sure which size is the right side up. 
doesn't really matter. I made uh, a Saturday shrug with uh, the remaining. So I finished all the uh, darker, uh, the darker gray, and this was the one I originally wanted. Yeah, at first, I wanted to uh, knit a sweater with, but there were not enough skins uh, for me to knit a sweater with that color. A light gray, which is the body, I knit everything. I knit everything from the blue, and as I said, I've finished that much of the white. I think I have a, just a little ball left over from that skin, and uh, uh, I have one remaining skin. And I've knit a hat too, and I'm going to stop here because the hat fell uh, on the floor when I was uh, arranging my knits on my laps. So uh, I had enough of the uh, lighter gray to knit the hat, and I finished um, the blue. It, this is the softy hat from uh, 50 weeks of 52 weeks of easy knits, uh, the Len magazine book, and uh, um, the designer is Jona Yetala of the softy hat. And uh, this hat I've been wearing a lot. I knit. A little, a little bit smaller, a smaller size. I think, I think I need the small size. Let me check, because I like uh, when hats. Um, I can't find it right now, but I, I, I look into my notes, and I will write it down below if I have it there. But I like the hats being a bit snug on myself. And there is one that I love that is a bit too big, and I think I'm gonna unravel and knit it again. Okay, so that's why I've knit with uh, my last, the yarn I bought last summer, and I had bought for other people, and it's been, um, I sent it out to the world. Okay, so um, we drove one, one, the beginning, it was not the morning, it was the beginning of the afternoon uh, with my, with my mother, and an hour and a half drive was way enough for her, I would say. So we arrived there and uh, she had um, an invitation on her Instagram. I'm gonna leave her Instagram and uh, down below and also the website, which is in French. And uh, um, as oh, at every video, I never, <laughs> I always forget to talk about the uh, description box where I write everything that I'm talking about. So you just look in down below the video or the little down arrow when you are on a mobile device. And uh, I haven't had enough time to write blog posts to have a more detailed version of the show notes, but at some point I will uh, start again <laughs> writing blog posts about uh, what I uh, publish on YouTube. So anyway, uh, we went down uh, to see her and she had um, a farm visit. It was at two o'clock in the afternoon. So um, we went there and there were two other families with uh, younger children. So she allowed me to take pictures, of course, to uh, film videos. And I'm gonna place videos here and there um, and pictures um, as I'm talking. I haven't uh, seen everything I filmed there and uh, uh, so I will have to make a selection and there are a couple pictures, additional pictures on her website. So her name is Amandine and she started her uh, the farm two years ago and so her parents retired and they were on that farm, on that site, and they were raising cows, I think I remember, either for meat or for milk. And there are uh, land that uh, they produce everything that the animals on the farm need. So of course now uh, the needs for from goats are quite different. 
uh, than the need uh, for uh, cows, from cows. But uh, she grows everything for the hay that um, goes into uh, the barn. And oh, I will have to check which one it is, the one that they just walk on and uh, um, that is on the ground and the one that they eat. So she produces at the same time uh, enough of the uh, veg <laughs> vegetables uh, to use on her farm with her goats. Uh, her goats also eat grass when they go outside, when the weather allows them to go outside, is warm enough. And she also supplements um, the goats, in particular when um, the mothers are having babies, when they are lambing, lambing I guess you say, and uh, uh, with dry food that she buys that is uh, specific for the goats with the right equilibrium between all the components and vitamins and everything. And what is really nice is that for uh, months before uh, we arrived there and we went to visit, all of the mothers had their babies and the youngest one was a week old or something like that. And these goats are very good mothers. Um, they take care of their babies very well. Um, they, all of them had their babies on their own, even though she was around and she was there. Only one had her babies, two, two lambs, during the night. Uh, all the other ones had their babies during the day, which is quite convenient for the farmer, I would I have to say. And uh, uh, there was no problem for them having their babies, no problem for the babies, no problem having um, them milk, enough mi having enough milk to feed the babies. And uh, except one mother, uh, she's a bit smaller, and it's a bit more difficult for her, so uh, Amandine tries to supplement her a bit more so that uh, she produces enough milk and doesn't uh, get uh, too thin uh, because she's uh, losing weight right now. So she has a particular, uh, she's taking care of that one mo mother, uh, in that mother goat in particular. She also has one male, so for now the male is the father of all the babies. And uh, they do exchanges between um, mohair farms with the goat's uh, semen so that there is no uh, genetic, uh, too, too, too much genetic inbreeding because uh, when you inbreed you select for diseases and uh, uh, animals are less healthy. So she has one male and several others that have been neutered. And uh, uh, what I have to say, these goats are very friendly. Even the males, we, the neutered one and the non-neutered one, we could you know, interact with them, we could pet them. They, these type of goats do not do the head-to-head you usually you can see a lot with goats or um, other deers and everything. They don't do that. They have horns. Um, the females have horns too, uh, but they don't do the head-to-head -head, uh, fights. Sometimes they do it to play because I guess it's some remnants of what their past and history and ancestors uh, were doing. Uh, but they are very peaceful, very friendly, and even the mothers with their babies, they were not that, they're not, not very afraid, not that friendly, but some of them were extremely friendly. There is a whole diversity of friendliness in the flock, and of course it depends on the goat's personalities, and some of them were extremely friendly and would let them be, you know, would let you pet them, pet their baby, no problem. So these goats uh, are from Tibet, the Himalayan, 
And they arrived in, I've, I've done my homework. <laughs> I've done my homework. So they arrived uh, in Turkey first, the first stop of the migration of the goods from Tibet, which is on this side for you, from Tibet to France, um, uh, had Turkey in the midway. So, um, so they are known uh, in Tibet, in the Himalayans, uh, from 2000 years before uh, Christ, I guess you say that, and uh, 400 years before Christ, uh, we start to have writings uh, on tablets and things like that about these uh, goats. And uh, so they are called in French Angora goats. I will have to check because Angora is for rabbits, I know in English. So I will have to check if Angora is also used for mohair um, goats in English. If not, uh, please forgive me. So at least these mohair goats, I guess you um, understand me if I say that. So uh, in the 11th century, they arrive in Turkey and in uh, an area that is the, the, right now the Ankara area and it's called Angora, at least in French. I will have also to check, even though I've done my homework, I haven't done that one homework. Uh, if it's called, if it was called Angora uh, beforehand too, but at least this area in Turkey. And they develop and with the exchange and with the commercial relationships um, that uh, arrive at that moment, um, it's in the 15th century that they arrived in France. Well, they started to be known and there was one flock uh, in France. And then after that, they uh, uh, continued to, um, uh, to grow. And at some point they disappeared. There were no more flocks uh, for mohair goats in France. And it's in the 80s that some farmers started to uh, import uh, the mohair uh, goats back again in France. And I have to say that the lady who is uh, in the farm from the Pyrenees, the lady who originally founded the farm, um, she uh, created that farm in uh, 1985. I discovered them in 1991 when I went back to France. So that's a long time ago. And it was her. She's retired now. And uh, so she was one of the farmers to uh, bring the goats back to France from Turkey. But it's the same species and the same uh, breed. Now, um, the activity has expanded. There are over 130 different farmers, at least who belong to the same association that Amandine uh, uh, belongs to, the farm from um, uh, Poitou, where my mother is. So I'm going to maybe have to take that little... Uh, thing that is uh, stuck on one ball, and it's uh, Le Moher des Fermes de France. Okay, so are you going to be focusing on that? Yes. Le Moher des Fermes de France. That means the Moher from farms from France or farms in France. So they have that little uh, picture of the yarn, the mohair yarn, a uh, mohair thread, and this font with their name. So uh, these 100 and over 130 farmers are organizing this association. And uh, uh, so the goats are shared about twice a year. Uh, it's been, so we are in April 2023 right now, and the goats were sheared, if I recall correctly, last February, so two months ago. So they are growing their hair back again. But I'll insert also a picture from last year where they were going to be sheared the week after 
I went to visit and their hair is over 15 centimeters, I will uh, find the inches equivalent, uh, 15 to 20 centimeters and uh, um, uh, very long and very curly. So when we visited last week, um, they had been sheared a month before, so they are growing back the hair and they will be sheared again uh, next summer. So they are sheared on average twice a year and uh, uh, they need to be sheared that much because the hair grow uh, quite fast. So in February, even in the center west of France where um, the weather is not that cold. Um, they were a bit cold after being sheared and uh, uh, so um, they were kept inside of the barn so I don't have pictures for that or footage for that and uh, uh, Amandine had uh, made a tent inside of the barn because the barn uh, was designed for cows so it's a big one and uh, uh, so uh, the, she, they were under two tents, there were two different uh, uh, areas with tents and uh, uh, lamps that were uh, heating the goats and the goats stayed uh, in the barn for, I'm not sure I recall, maybe she's mentioned it but I do not recall, some time until they could go out again. Uh, when we, vi we visited, we did not see what the group of what she called the teenagers. Uh, because with the mothers and the babies, um, the teenagers, so they are the goats that are not adults yet, it's about two or three years for a goat to be adult, I do not recall what she said, but it's within that range. And uh, so they are like teenagers, like human teenagers, they run a lot, they jump a lot, they play a lot, and uh, as the weather was mild and nice, um, they were outside and she's uh, taking them back inside uh, every night in a different place from the mothers and the babies. And she takes them out um, every day uh, so that they go to different pastures so that they can eat uh, fresh grass that hasn't been stumped. And uh, there is enough time for, between pastures, between the different fields, uh, for the grass to grow back up and you know she has a rotation so that they eat fresh a lot of fresh and nice grass outside. The mothers and the babies um, can go out so they have what she calls a terrace and the terrace is a place where it's, it's mostly concrete and there is no grass there and uh, so they can freely go from within inside of the barn to the outside of the barn and uh, so she let them out she showed us how they were going in and out when we arrived it was they were all inside and the door was closed and so there is a bit of a space where they can go out and back in and she does take the mothers and the babies out for a day when it's really nice. Um, now in the fields, because the babies are starting to eat other things, you know, like, than milk. So they start to eat hay, dried uh, uh, grass and fresh grass. It's a joyful flock. Um, the babies were not that active, a bit sometimes jumping around, but uh, she says that uh, she brings everyone inside. The teenagers, <laughs> the males, the mothers and the babies are kept inside every night uh, because there are some robbery in the area and she doesn't want to lose her goats. So all the goats are kept inside and the farm is guarded by dogs, uh, big dogs. Um, these dogs are uh, farm dogs. They can be trained to be um, working with the goats. 
but she doesn't use these dogs and um, the name of the dog escapes me right now. It's going to come back, I'm sure. She has another dog that is specialized, that is very gentle with the goats. Uh, the same breed that uh, the lady from the Pyrenees uh, has to help her with her. She has two in the Pyrenees. And I think the dog that Amandine has comes from um, the lady from the Pyrenees. If I recall correctly uh, what the lady said last summer, I think. I'm not sure, but it doesn't really matter. So um, this one dog is the one she, uh, um, she's been helped, who, who helped her uh, moving the goats around. And this is also one of the other reasons she uh, let the goats in and out every day. So first, for their safety. And the second reason is that uh, she has her dog, her dog work with the flock uh, at least twice a day. So she keeps her dog trained uh, with the flock because there are no more goats. Uh, on the farm, her parents retired, they uh, let her use the barn and she has a caravan next to the barn, I guess, for her to live and they live in the farm building um, itself. So she has another part of the farm where she has uh, her store, uh, where she sells at the same time um, skins of uh, mohair and already made uh, scarves and sweaters and things like that, garments. So the goats go uh, outside during the day in different area uh, on the farm and the males are usually not in the same field as the teenagers um, but the three males that we see, two neutered one and one full male oh, my uh, computer is... Uh, making some noises, so let's see if that's going to be stopping soon, um, are together and uh, the mother and the babies and the teenagers are um, together and everyone is separated. Okay, so it was the software encoding the video that was draining my computer CPU, I guess, so I stopped and uh, I'm recording again. Okay, so I'm not sure where uh, I was at, uh, but anyway, I forgot to show you um, the little card uh, that uh, she has about her own farm. I'm, I'm sure at this point of the video, you already have seen the goods and all the things. So yeah, I was saying that she has a boutique, she has a shop on the farm, and this part of the barn has also been restored and uh, with, you have open walls, stone walls in the, in the shop uh, and, you know, with everywhere else. It's a very, very beautiful place. So, uh, the uh, Mo Mohair des Fermes de France, I'm not sure you have the logo here. And I uh, stuck it back on the yarn ball, yeah. So the Moher Mo des Fermes de France. So I looked what the status of that was. It's an association and she's detailed uh, all the process uh, that happens to uh, the uh, fleeces once uh, the goats are sheared and uh, have been sheared. And uh, um, you may have already heard me say that I would like to focus on um, knitting, just a focus, it's a choice, but other things can happen, of course. Um, on uh, yarn, I know where it comes from, I know how it's been processed, um, if possible close uh, or not too far away from me, and uh, also from places I, I visit. And of course, people have sent me, offered me yarn last year, my children, some friends from um, the social networks, uh, from either YouTube, YouTube or uh, Instagram. Uh, but of course, I 
prefer, I, I want to focus on, on knitting yarn I know where uh, it's coming from. And uh, so she's detailed all the process because last year, I'm not sure we had uh, talked about all that uh, uh, together. Uh, so once the uh, goats are sheared, she and some of her friends, because there are about 30 adults uh, now uh, that can be sheared in her flock, so it's quite a big flock, from the two years with the babies. Um, so she's kept everyone. Everyone was alive in good health and uh, uh, she's grown her flock from, I guess she bought seven uh, goats from um, the lady from the Pyrenees uh, the first year. And last year she bought another five from her and, and some other ones from elsewhere. I do not recall what she said about that. Uh, so when the flock is all sheared, so it's a whole day. Then uh, she and other people uh, go through the fleeces, remove the big chunks and sort them out. Um, there are three different categories depending on the width, the microns uh, of the fleece. And uh, so she puts each fleece or each part of the fleece in each category. And why do they do that? Because in the association, um, Moer, Moer des Fermes de France, everyone give their fleeces to the association because having the fleeces washed and combed and uh, carded and uh, um, spinned and everything, altogether uh, is less expensive than if each individual farmer had to do that on its own, on their own. So um, she makes three categories and ships uh, the fleeces. Once the association, who, which is in France, I'm not sure I recall where they are located uh, exactly, and uh, I may, I may, I may know somewhere. Yeah, in the southeast of France, in Castres. So uh, Castres uh, is in the southeast of France, and if you know France, Castres is uh, well known for uh, rugby teams. Anyway, uh, so she sh ships her fleeces, and once they arrive, uh, there, they are uh, graded according to the micron uh, of each uh, individual fleece and each individual lot. So they do samples on every bag of every, so there is one bag for one fleece and uh, they do sample, they test the width of the uh, hair, the goat hair, the yarn, the threads. And uh, um, they categorize um, the mohair that way. This is to ensure that what she gets back is the correct amount of each individual uh, or each category of um, width for the hair, the micron, the number of micrometers for um, the yarn. So there are you know, babe, what we call baby mohair or baby, uh, the very fine, finest mohair and, uh, you know, bigger mohair, still fluffy and even a bigger one. So uh, that also ensures that people doing their work correctly uh, do not get bad yarn back from people who did not do, or a batch of bad yarn uh, from, or bad mohair from people who did not do their work correctly. Because it's the same for everyone, they all have the same rules, and every single fleece is tested and placed into the proper category, and then individually processed. And so she knows, uh, how much of her, each category she's sent out. And they confirm with their own analysis. 
And then when she receives the end product, she has the correct number of grams of or kilograms mostly uh, of each category she sent out. So then um, the so she has cleaned the first she has done the hand clean the first hand cleaning uh, on the farm the then the mohair undergoes the regular uh, yarn process it's washed it's carded it's combed so that all the fibers align and they make big. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I recall the name in English, it's snap in French, but anyway, the big fleeces with all the uh, hair aligned and then they are uh, spinned and uh, placed or put into individual bowls depending on um, the grade of the mohair and sent back to her. Um, she also uses the same association to have the yarn dyed before she receives uh, the dyed ones. So um, she has a palette of colors, a range of colors um, she can choose from, but she doesn't dye on her own on her farm. The undyed one is uh, the white one I've showed before. It's uh, um, so the, the, the goats are a, a bit gray on the outside because they are not completely clean. Um, just the dust from the barn and, you know, because goats live, uh, they live outside, they have babies and everything. Uh, but once it's washed, it's that very, very bright and shiny uh, white. That is not very, there is not much cream and you can see the thickness of the fiber and, uh, and the, you know, all the plush and everything. And, uh, um, uh, but uh, all the other colors are uh, from an array she can choose from. And when I went there, there she did not have a lot of stock uh, of uh, um, Yarn because um, since last year the whole process has uh, takes more time that than it used to. Um, today she should have had the full products or at least part of it from the previous uh, February when she shared the uh, the goats and. Uh, um, the one from the year before, last summer, was all sold out um, uh, during the uh, Christmas time. So um, I've, I, I said, okay, so let me see which, what we are going to have. And I am going to come back next summer. So please, <laughs> can you keep that, that, that for me, uh, please? So... Um, I will <laughs> buy more uh, next summer. Anyway, she receives um, either undyed or dyed yarn. And then she sells. So last summer, it was the first time she opened her own shop on the farm. And she um, also sells on local fairs, local farmers markets, open markets, uh, some of the villages during the summertime have night markets. So she goes everywhere to sell her yarn and she has, she sends out some of um, her mohair to a company that makes garments, uh, mostly shawls and uh, sweaters and things like that. Um, socks and uh, she also has people who knit for her and knit other pieces that can be also sold uh, on her farm so as I said last winter time was a very good winter time for her because she sold out almost every of her yarn to be knitted all over skeins and uh, she still has a lot of garments uh, that you can buy or that you can sell, but uh, a very, very small box 
of mohair that was left. And uh, um, she had a couple more uh, skeins in the back. So I'm going to tell you just after that what I bought. Um, the way she needs the socks, she says the socks can go in the washer at 30 degrees Celsius. So I will also write the conversion in Fahrenheit below. I, 30 degrees is low temperature, uh, at least in France, for a washing machine. And so I guess on delicate or wool cycle and 30 degrees, if you buy socks from her, you can throw them in the washing machine. I've bought socks from the Pyrenees, uh, but it's not 100% mohair, it's mohair and silk, and uh, uh, the silk holds better during the washing process and doesn't shrink that much. So I guess uh, felt that much. So uh, I guess that's why, and I, sorry, I did not ask her um, how the socks were made. So they are commercially uh, knitted. It's not people who knit socks. Anyway, she did not have many skeins, uh, but uh, fortunately, she had enough for me to buy a sweater's quantity of the dark gray I was looking or I wanted last summer. I was not looking for it because, uh, of course, I did not know what to expect. Um, but I have a sweater's quantity. I think I have... I do not recall 10 balls. Um, let me see on that side, it will be maybe better for you to see. And you can see the fuzziness uh, of the mohair, it's the same. And this mohair, I do not recall, I've, I wrote it down, I think it's 100 meters per 50 grams. So I have more than enough uh, for a uh, sweater's quantity. So I guess I can uh, have more for someone. Um, I also bought, and I'm not going to be showing it to you because I'm going to be shipping it um, to someone else, uh, some, some, some other for someone else. So I'm not talking about it, I just say it, and uh, we'll talk about prices when I talk about my next um, uh, Yarn No Buy Year series. It should have been today, but I was too happy to talk about um, uh, the farm I visited. So, um, uh, yeah, so one sweater quantity and most probably a bit more uh, from the same mohair I bought uh, last summer. Okay, next, I really treated myself. Really, <laughs> it was not necessary. My mother insisted she wanted to buy uh, some yarn for me and I bought more for myself. Um, she has this quality of very fine lace type of mohair um, that the lady from the Pyrenees doesn't have. And uh, uh, when I saw, and I, she did not have it last summer or I did not see it. Uh, it's that, that very, very, very fine mohair. And it's 20 grams, 20 grams balls. And it's um, 200 meters per 20 grams. So it's mohair and silk. I'll see if I can find the percentage of silk uh, in, the, in the mohair. And so she had that dusty pink. Pink is not much of my own color range, but I really, really liked it a lot. It's very shiny. Uh, it's dusty pink, she calls it dusty rose. And I had uh, this book, I sh have showed it to you already, the Cosmology uh, book, the Dharma Collection 2022 by Amerisu. And I had already my eyes on dusking. So it's that sweater, uh, which is knit um, with more hair. And uh, uh, so you have 
the top of the sweater, which is with four strands of mohair, and gradually you go to three strands, two strands, and then here one strand of mohair. And it's a very loose fitting sweater. I'm not sure I'm going to make it that loose. Uh, but anyway, I was liking very, very much this effect. Um, I'm not sure there are many patterns like that one. I'll try to pop up uh, pictures from, um, from the sweater. There are other, other pictures here, I think. I'm not sure I've seen that many patterns. So here is another one. That's the back. Uh, of the sweater with an open back and you can see the different uh, width, uh, thickness of mohair. It's, it's uh, thicker here, of course, it's not see-through and then uh, you gra gradually go to uh, a more open uh, fabric and that is see-through at the bottom of the body and at the bottom of the uh, sleeves. When that was one of the reasons, one of the patterns I bought uh, the book from for. Um, so, okay, Ramses is on the table. We'll see what he's going to be doing. But uh, Onyx is not sleeping on the cat tree. <laughs> he's on the couch, so uh, I guess it's going to be better if uh, Ramses goes back on the uh, to his sleeping place. So you're coming, you're coming. Anyway, uh, that, the dusking was one of the um, reasons I bought uh, the book. Uh, so I'm very, very happy I'm going to be making it. She only had the sweaters enough for uh, that sweater uh, in the dusty pink. She had another, uh, I would say, um, like duck green um i the name escapes me in english um a very bright green blue green uh not turquoise not turquoise and there is mallard i think but yeah mallard a uh, type of uh, color and i also let my mother buy me the five remain the last uh five skins of this uh baby blue and uh, I'm going to use that baby blue with some of the yarn uh, held together uh, to make something. I'm not quite decided. I had an idea when I bought the yarn, but I'm not sure I'm going to do what I had in mind. So for now, I'm just going to let um, the idea bubble up and or bubble down and, uh, um, and see what I'm going to be coming up with. Okay, so what are you going to be doing, please? <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, when I was away, my cats were at uh, a shelter. Uh, it's not a shelter where abandoned <laughs> animals go. It's a shelter that specializes into uh, breeding dogs. And she, they used to breed cats, but they do not bring cat, breed cats any longer. He's making biscuits on my mohair sweater, and I don't want him to do that. So please do not. And uh, uh, so they go to that uh, shelter that I called an expensive hotel for them. Uh, and um, but they are in cages. It's not the same way you can have elsewhere. I've seen people talk about daycare for their animals, where all the animals are together. They don't mix animals from different families. So the cats can be two in the same place, which is a cage. Let's be honest, it, it's a cage. Uh, but it's about... So there is uh, two, st two uh, stories inside. There is a ground floor and a top floor and they can go and there is a place to um, sleep, a place to eat and some other place uh, for them to go to the bathroom about with what, what's necessary for them. Uh, but anyway, they are inside. So they let them out one by one or two by two when they clean every day. Uh, but uh, Ramses and Onyx are very, very shy cats. And this, when, when they are here to clean um, their cage, uh, they don't go out. They stay 
they have a box with holes they can go in and hide inside so I leave all um, sweaters old sweaters and toys and things for them but they stay within that box all the time when uh, the people open their door to clean to clean them so um, Ham says he's very insisting into being with me uh, since I've been back they stayed there for a week Onyx is a bit mad at me and uh, he's not talking to me and he's not coming to see me and Peluche came to sleep with me but uh, once again she sometimes comes and talks to me but uh, Ramses is the one that is most uh, demanding into uh, for hugs and uh, yeah I guess I guess <laughs> they were um, a bit unhappy to be within a cage for a week but so be it and I, I don't want to leave them at my house and have someone come and check and give them food and water every day. So, because I'll talk about that uh, some other day if, you, if you're if <laughs> interested into that. Anyway, so I bought uh, a sweater's quantity for uh, with the uh, bigger mohair, uh, one with the uh, uh, finer lace mohair and I have enough to make five balls to make maybe a vest or something and hold help, or a hat or something and a shawl and uh, held, held, hold um, the blue one uh, together with uh, some other yarn. So uh, I think that's all I wanted to say, uh, Amandine is so nice, so friendly, so willing to explain and answer questions and everything. So she's had uh, two years of activity right now. She is giving herself five years to see if she can continue and live from her activity from her job that is raising goats and making more hair. Um, she did not quite answer the question when I asked her if she was already living from it. She escaped the answer. Uh, but so I guess it's quite heavy and quite complicated. But um, she said her flock uh, all the goats are health, healthy. She did not lose any. She did not lose for the two years. She did not lose any baby. Uh, none of them got sick. Um, she has the routine checkups by the vet whenever they are needed or they need to be done uh, for all the regulations and everything. Um, she's a member of that association uh, that uh, processes um, the yarn and sends back to her um, the quantity that she sent originally sent back to them uh, uh, skinned and dyed. So uh, uh, I think she's she's on a roll right now and she needs to uh, uh, sell enough of her products to be able to live at least live and have her, her flock live uh, from it. She has to buy some of the food, the dry food. You've seen, you've seen um, the, the dry food that she gets. It's a special thing for these goods. And so, but all the rest is produced on the farm. So um, there you have it. If you are ever in the area, uh, I will write uh, down below the exact address and the website and uh, her Instagram and you can contact her. Uh, go to see her, you know, have business with her. I'm not sure. I'm not sure she sells uh, online. Um, there is no online... Uh, um, selling process on her website, but she says to contact her. So she can arrange, she can arrange um, to ship uh, yarn. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I got five balls the day I was there, and I need ten to make um, the, the skin, the skin sweater. So she's shipping 
five additional ones um, that I'm going to be also paying. So uh, by a direct bank transfer. So, uh, you know, she can do it. I'm not sure how she does it for other people or if she would ship outside of France, you have to ask her. And if you are interested, you can ask me in the comments down below and I will ask her and I will tell you again. Um, I will go back next uh, uh, summer, a few months from now, because I'm going to go once again visit my mother next summer. And um, it, it was a one hour and so drive. We stayed there for a couple of hours, you know, enough time to go visit the farm and listen to what she had to say. There were little kids that were asking questions and everything. So maybe an hour and a half, two hours. And another hour ba driving back, or hour and 20 minutes driving back to my mother's house. At the end, she was exhausted. <laughs> she sat down, well, that's peluche that uh, uh, clawing, making her claws on the uh, cat tree. Uh, she sat down on a chair, on an armchair in her living room. It was at the end of the day and she fell right asleep. So uh, it was a long drive, a long afternoon for her, but she was extremely happy to be there. And she's been talking about that the next few days. So her memory um, was at least still fresh for that in the ne in the few days after uh, we went there, and yeah, she was very happy. She said she would go back uh, next summer with me, and I told her that we will have to see if it's not too hot because the center of France can be quite hot during the summertime, and if it's too hot, it's going to be too difficult. Um, for her to go there, uh, so or to spend the afternoon or half a day, morning or something. So, uh, yes, that was a very pleasant visit. I'm very happy to know how now better how the mohair is produced. Um, the goats are magnificent, can I say that? They are very friendly. The babies are really funny. We did not get to see the teenagers, the teenagers, because as uh, we were with some younger kids, they were in the field a bit further away. Um, so we did, she did not want to walk uh, in the fields. You know, she can, she can. I could because I had big boots, but uh, not everyone was uh, had shoes that could cross fields. So, uh, so we did not go and see the teenagers that were jumping all around too. And uh, it was a very pleasant time and I'm looking forward to um, going there once again next uh, summer. So there you have it. I will go there next summer. I have, you know, reserved some quantities of some of the colors that uh, I was interested in too. And uh, I hope that you enjoy this uh, Woody Stories episode. I hope that um, maybe you will find, because some other uh, Mohair de France uh, products, if you ever visit France. And I hope you, this, this half hour, maybe an hour, uh, brought you much joy and happiness within your day. And I hope that your knitting is also bringing you as much joy and happiness at, uh, as it's bringing me right now. Because I had a lot of time knitting with my mother. She doesn't move much, <laughs> so I knit a lot. And uh, yes, I thank you very much for being here with me. I really hope all the little stitches from everyone are like little sparks of joy during your day. And uh, I will see you next time.